This is CBC Here and Now. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. There are two new firsts for the COVID-19 crisis in this province. We have the first person in hospital and the first person who has recovered from the illness. Here and Now's Peter Cowan joins us live with the latest details. So Peter, how do the numbers look today? Carolyn, probably not a surprise, but we have more positive cases in this province. So let's get straight to those numbers and look at how they're breaking down today. So there are 20 new cases. All but one are in the eastern region. The other is in Labrador, and it's related to travel. That brings the total to 102 cases so far. But an important bit of context here, 68 of those cases, or two-thirds, are all connected to that one funeral at Calls in St. John. So that is a reminder, of course, with that one event causing so many cases that physical distancing is important. We heard from the health minister today. He said he doesn't want to see people getting together in sheds on the weekend. That's going to create problems. And we had a similar message from the premier. I know that people would want to burn some of that stress and experience a sense of normalcy in their life. We want to spend some time with your family and friends but we impact those around us. As Dr. Fitzgerald said, we must always keep social and physical distancing paramount in all the things that we do. Six feet apart is what we mean when we say that. Today, we did hear from the Chief Medical Officer of Health that so far, they don't have any evidence that this disease is in the community. So far, all the cases have either been linked to travel or that one event, and they're hoping to try and keep it that way. Carolyn? At least eight paramedics are among dozens of employees who can no longer work within the province's health care system because they are now self-isolating. They join nurses and dozens of others who won't be able to work for at least two weeks. Anthony is with me now to talk about the situation paramedics face and to look at how well equipped they are to do their jobs. Anthony? Yeah, the question here, uh, Carolyn, has to do with the safety of paramedics, which, as we all know, is a dangerous job at the best of times. And what is the safety and what are the implications during a pandemic? Well, Dr. Hagee talked about this during yesterday's briefing. And if you take a look, he also went to social media and he made this post in which he said, it's very unfortunate that we have four paramedic teams, that's eight people, in self-isolation because they were not informed about the travel history or the contact history with someone diagnosed with COVID-19 before arriving to help a patient in distress. Now, the question this raises, of course, is that in the case of an emergency, if someone's having a heart attack or falls down a flight of stairs and is unconscious, are people really going to say, oh, by the way, they had a cough or they're in breathing difficulty or they had symptoms of a cold? Possibly not. But equally difficult to understand right now, how does this gel with the message that Dr. Hagee was putting out earlier this week? The only safe assumption for anyone in this province is your next door neighbor has this virus. So when you take Dr. Hagee's advice earlier in the week, if we're supposed to assume that all of our neighbors are already infected with COVID-19, then the question is, why haven't paramedics been going to every single call with that same assumption that the people they're trying to help and rescue have also been suffering from COVID-19? And that is a matter, the issue of paramedics, which came up at today's briefing. Paramedics and uh, healthcare professionals have a series of protocols uh, to help them uh, manage individuals who um, they go to, to treat. Certainly from the point of view of paramedicine, uh, one of the things I have to emphasize and has not always happened is that paramedics are going to calls from people who actually know that they have been exposed potentially to COVID or have traveled abroad and have not actually revealed this. If people will not be honest for fear that they are somehow going to get a lesser standard of care or people will not come, then I can reassure them now quite clearly and categorically that if you need an ambulance, it will come whether or not you have been abroad, whether or not you think you have COVID-19 or not. That is irrelevant, but it is important that the staff know so they can protect themselves. So, Anthony, we spoke earlier in the week about nurses being concerned about equipment shortages. How similar are the concerns for paramedics in the province? Well, actually, they're very similar, and a lot of them are all on that, this mask that I showed you earlier this week on here. Now, these N95 masks, 
And the issue there is whether it's masks or gowns uh, and surgical masks, the, the ordinary ones, this all goes back to China. So if you think of what happened in Wuhan, for two and a half months, the Chinese, which is the world's largest supplier of this kind of equipment, they locked everything down. They weren't manufacturing this stuff because all factories were shut down. And they were dealing with their own coronavirus outbreak at that time. And so we're in a situation now where the Chinese have gotten things back to where they were. But look at what's happened in the United States. Just yesterday, the United States surpassed China, which had had 80,000 cases. Now the United States has more than that. And so the United States needs equipment too. So Newfoundland and Labrador is not just competing against provinces within Canada. We are competing against the rest of the world to get this kind of equipment. So this is an extremely difficult situation, and there is no indication that the supply uh, is going to meet the demand. Carolyn? Thanks, Anthony. Well, the president of the union representing paramedics says there are ways for the public to help protect paramedics right now. If you're calling from a residence, you're calling from an area, you knew the person that needs medical assistance, needs paramedics, was out of the country within the last period of time, make them aware up front. Uh, make them aware if they've been tested or under testing protocols. Well, there have been hundreds of job losses here in the province, tens of thousands across the country as companies grapple with COVID-19 and its economic impact. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced enhanced measures to help businesses keep employees on the payroll. Last week, we had announced that we would cover 10% of wages, but it's becoming clear that we need to do more, much more. So we're bringing that percentage up to 75%. This means that people will continue to be paid even though their employer has had to slow down or stop its operations. So there may be some companies here that will benefit from today's, today's announcement. Here now's Terry Roberts has been tracking the list of job losses here and joins us from his home. So Terry, what are you learning about this? Yeah, well, Carolyn, I think what I've learned so far this week is that with very few exceptions, just about every business in every sector of industry in this province has been impacted by this pandemic. Just from talking to some of the companies in the last few days, I can easily add up more than 2,000 job losses. I mean, if you, even if you look at the Husky operation, trying to build the West White Rose extension project here in Newfoundland, they've shut down the operation construction there in Argentia, 600 plus workers. They shut down construction in Marystown, Muskrat Falls, where there were 500 construction workers. That's now in a care and maintenance mode. And Voise's Bay, you know, they had 800 workers up there up a couple of weeks ago. Now they're down to just 600. But thankfully, uh, Valet is continuing to pay those employees. Our cross-island transportation link, the bus service, DRL coach lines, they suspended their uh, operations a couple of days ago. That's 22 job losses right there. Now the owner, Jason uh, Roberts, tells me he says salaries are only 25% of his costs. He has big costs in fuel. He has big costs in uh, bus maintenance. So he says that's really not going to help him right now. He needs, he's asking for the provincial government to come on board and give him some help to try and get that bus service uh, back on track. And also some of the medium-sized business owners that I've talked about say there's a cap on this wage subsidy. And that one person told me that, look, it's probably not even worth the effort, the administrative effort to go and uh, do the paperwork that's needed to get this subsidy and that, than it would be to get workers back. And she also told me that a lot of per uh, workers right now they just don't want to come to work because of the fear of over, over COVID-19 uh, and also the fact that they can probably stay home right now, get about 55% of their uh, 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 wages on EI and not have to worry about the fear of COVID-19. So, this, you know, there's a long road ahead of us here and a lot of uncertainty when it comes to jobs in this province. Carolyn? A long road for sure. Thanks so much, Terry. And with so many people losing their jobs, the demand for food banks is expected to rise. In Marystown, the Sacred Heart Family Aid Food Bank is already feeling the pressure. It's going to get worse. Like, you can't see it getting any better for the time being. Um, it's going to be a really bad year ahead for food banks. We cover a lot of, like, the Bjorn Peninsula itself. There's only certain communities that have food banks. So, like, whether it's from Terrenceville, right up uh, counting St. Lawrence, whether it's over in Fortune, um, you know, we handle all those, and we're getting calls from all over.
While most people in the province are isolating at home, others don't have that option. Joining me now is Joanne Thompson of The Gathering Place, a community organization that helps people who are homeless or living in poverty. So Ms. Thompson, how is the center coping with this health crisis? You know, I, I think Carolyn, we are doing what we do incredibly well, which is pull together as a community. Um, lean in with our collaborative partners and say, what is it that we need to do to ensure that the most vulnerable adults in our community are cared for? Um, we've switched to takeout meals, which um, has, is working quite well. The challenge that we are encountering is that we're still seeing vast numbers of people come each day, um, a couple of times a day, to pick up food. And that's really um, uh, underlying the key issue here, which is the fact that people need to be able to self-isolate. But if you don't have um, that safe space to call home, then there is no way that you can isolate in place. And so that's uh, really our urgent need right now is a way that we can creatively um, find space for people who uh, right now are still living in large clusters in an unsuitable places. We are hoping to be able to um, bring partners to the table and say, look, let's get ahead of this as a preventative measure. Let's not wait till people start to test positive in this community, because we also know that chronic illness um, is a reality for most individuals. So um, they already present with um, uh, challenges with um, uh, respiratory conditions and, and other really predominant um, uh, health considerations that will make it far more difficult to manage an outbreak in the community. So it's really around prevention and time is with us at this moment. So let's quickly find solutions. What could that solution be? What more needs to be put in place to uh, either prevent an outbreak from happening in that population or should one happen be able to contain it and to take care of those people? I think the first step, you know, it's, it really seems quite basic is to say and acknowledge we have a number of people that we have to quickly house and once we say that i think there's enough goodwill in the community that we can pull it together but we have to acknowledge that um you know 200 people should not be coming here for lunch each day so let's do something to change that all right joanne thompson thank you so much for checking in with us and giving us this update thank you so much The area of low pressure that moved through or is moving through tonight is going to continue on and uh, bring some blizzard conditions for parts of Labrador as we head through the weekend. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet. I'll have all those details coming up.
One thing that won't be stopping during this mass shutdown is flyer delivery. Here now's Meg Roberts explains why. A lot has changed over the past couple weeks. The way you grocery shop, your plans on a Friday night, even the way you open a door. But there are some things that have stayed the same. For example, go bags. Flyers are still being distributed to your front door. Now I've seen some comments online wondering why. In an email sent to staff, Saltwire, the company behind GoBag says flyers are more important now than ever with layoffs and job losses in the province. People will be looking for sales and the best prices. But Saltwire has made changes. It's reduced the number of employees to come in contact with the product. During delivery, they are maintaining physical distance and are expected to use gloves to deliver when possible. We also asked the health department about those go bags. It says they do not pose a risk for COVID-19. So while the rest of your routine might be anything but normal, you can be sure you're still going to get those deals right to your door. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. And it may be spring on the calendar, but it certainly doesn't look like it uh, in Corner Brook. They had a very healthy dose of snow overnight, so it's still a winter wonderland on the West Coast. Time to check in with Ashley in the weather forecast and uh, those snow banks out there took quite the beating from all of the rain that we've had today. Yeah, exactly. Even though the weather's not desirable by any means, uh, it is good when it starts <laughs> to take away all this snow, certainly on the Avalon uh, that we still have. Let's take a look at the temperatures so far today. This is where we were sitting in the single digits on the plus side of the mercury for most of us. Four degrees in Badger so far today, minus one in Happy Valley Goose Bay. We've got those uh, temperatures starting to climb up through St. Anthony, currently sitting at one degree. Now, those temperatures will continue to climb as we head through the overnight as this low continues to track a little bit further north. Now, seeing some snow now, but we should see a transition through to freezing rain and eventually rain for areas in the northern, uh, northern peninsula east anyway. And we do still have those winter storm warnings in effect for you along the strait. Snowfall warnings for the rest of the southeast coast and then those blizzard warnings from Maine to Makovic. Now we could see upwards of 30 to as much as 50 millimeters or centimeters of snow rather and uh, kill about 100 kilometer per hour wind. So conditions won't really start to improve for you until uh, at least Sunday, Saturday night into Sunday morning. So here's where we're sitting tonight. There's that rain that's going to head towards the southeastern portion of Labrador. Note these winds are going to stay pretty strong through the overnight tonight, especially up through coastal Labrador. And then in behind this system, that snow on the, or the rain on the west coast rather is going to change back over to snow as we get into that onshore flow. Uh, for you on the west coast could pick up a couple of centimeters by the time that's all said and done and then as we head into saturday afternoon things generally those winds will generally ease slightly anyway 40 to 50 kilometer per hour winds but a little bit of a system will continue uh, to affect parts of the avalon so still have that potential for some flurries and or uh, some showers into the afternoon as those temperatures will sit around the two degree mark for St. John's. Those winds will ease, which is good news, uh, but we're going to continue to see the snow and blowing snow for Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around minus one. Now into Sunday, we're going to stay with a northeasterly flow. There's a potential that we could see some freezing drizzle in that onshore flow along the northeast. Otherwise, especially potentially even here uh, in the metro area, Otherwise, we should see plenty of sunshine, uh, three to as much as five degrees for areas uh, away from the northeast coast. And then up through Labrador, beautiful day. Happy Valley Goose Bay should reach a high near four degrees with plenty of sunshine. Now, just before we leave you, we've been seeing lots of photos of the sun halos. And uh, that is that just pretty much means weather's coming. And boy, was that right. Thank you so much to Nancy Morris for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Beautiful shot. Thanks so much. And uh, have a great weekend, Ashley. You too. What started out as a snowmobile ride for a group of friends on Wednesday suddenly turned into a rescue mission involving a trapped moose. Here and now's Troy Turner has that story. When Mark Weir first came upon a hole in the snow, he figured there was no way something fell inside. And I went over by it and there was only a small hole there. I said, man, there's no way a moose fell in this, this hole. There's no way. So I kind of walked up to the tree pretty carefully and peeked in the hole. And sure enough, there's this moose probably 
four or five feet under the snow staring up at me. It was pretty crazy. Weir and three of his friends were snowmobiling near Eagle Mountain Pond on the northern peninsula. When one of the three moose they saw in the area disappeared, they kicked into rescue mode. We're coming for you, buddy. They dug a sloped walkway for the moose to exit, but left a barrier of snow around the moose to minimize its panic. Finally, the moose was able to break through the remaining snow. Once he got out, he stopped and stared at us, as you can see in the video. And uh, a, lot, a lot of people are commenting saying he definitely thanked you. But uh, the way his ears were pinned back and the fur was standing up on his back, it didn't look like much of a thanks. Like uh, <laughs> he didn't he didn't attack, thankfully. But uh, I think he was just trying to find a clear path to get away from us because he was probably pretty scared. There you go. Go find your friends. Reporting for CBC News, I'm Troy Turner. Time to find out who's celebrating. Happy 64th anniversary to Garland and Stella Perry. 
Happy 50th anniversary to Carl and Betty Hooper of Marystown. Gilbert and Lillian Thomas celebrated their 57th anniversary last Sunday. Happy 52nd anniversary to John and Ruby McGonagall of St. Anthony. Happy 54th anniversary to Ephraim and Dorothy Hiscock of Trinity. Happy 93rd birthday to Lehman Gale of Robinsons. Happy 92nd birthday to Kate Buzain of Bishop's Falls. Happy 97th birthday to Eileen Arnold from Traytown. Happy 98th birthday to twins Alice Clark of Paradise and Mabel Daw of CBS. Happy 91st birthday to Peter Hall of Newtown. Happy 95th birthday to Lucy Boyd of Port Saunders. George and Nancy Himian of Botwood are celebrating their 62nd anniversary tomorrow. Happy 53rd anniversary to Fraser and Betty Moss of Lethbridge. Happy 50th anniversary to Beryl and and Henry Krant, who celebrate tomorrow. Happy 90th birthday, Herbert Party from Cobb's Arm. Happy 94th birthday to Ursula Chambers of Blue Cove. Happy 100th birthday tomorrow to Rita O'Brien, originally from Cape Royal. Happy 61st anniversary to John and Phoebe Peril. Happy birthday to Robert McDonald, who turns 90. Happy 94th birthday to Donald Burton of Fortune. Happy 92nd birthday to Donald Freak from Boyd's Cove. Annie Clark is celebrating her 92nd birthday today. And happy birthday to Rita Rose of St. John's, who is 97 today. Congratulations once again. Well, some of the world's most crowded cities are seeing more wide open spaces these days with COVID-19 restrictions in force. Though still too many, far fewer people than usual ventured out to catch the seasonal beauty of cherry trees in bloom in the Japanese capital. Many city parks have been closed and authorities in Japan have advised residents to avoid all non-essential outings. Given the number of people breaking that rule though, Tokyo's governor fears an explosion in virus infections this weekend. Pandemic or no, the world continues to turn and for those at no risk of spreading COVID-19, new adventures continue to unfold. Like for this newborn taking his first dive in the big pool at the Belgian Zoo this week. This uh, sort of wee one is not even two months old yet and technically he's not swimming since hippo, hippos don't actually swim. This zoo, like others around the world, is on lockdown but cameras captured his big moment. Some Canadian zoos, including the Calgary Zoo, are currently providing access to some of their residents online too. And before we leave you, congratulations to Megan Gale Coles, who has won the 2019 BMO Winter Set Award for her book, Small Game Hunting, at the local Coward Gun Club. The award celebrates excellence in Newfoundland and Labrador writing. Coles is originally from Savage Cove on the Great Northern Peninsula. That's it for us tonight, everyone. Stay safe this weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Next, we have news from CBC Nova Scotia. Good night.